Thank you. Thank you for having me here and uh, thank you for all of you, um, you know, coming to listen. Uh, I, um, the, the, the talk is about um, the function of style, but I won't go through, uh, you know, the history of style and uh, I will try to illustrate it um, through, through three projects of the office. And I will try to go through them in detail, but fast. Um, today, um, we are somehow inundated or surrounded by politics with a capital P. Um, grand narratives, manifestos, uh, large-scale changes, you know, it, they hit us uh, uh, every day all around us. Uh, uh, what my uh, uh, talk is about is that we as architects have somehow two positions that we occupy simultaneously. We are citizens, and as citizens, uh, you know, we can, um, we are conscious of the fact that uh, we need to take a more active role in our society. Uh, we can march, uh, we can sign petitions. Uh, we can uh, also in our professional capacity, we can uh, decide uh, what clients we work with or not. Uh, we can raise money uh, to fund perhaps certain projects that we think are missing in perhaps uh, in the areas that we, we, we practice uh, and so on and so on. Um, but I, my, my talk about is a, dif is a different kind of activism, which is through uh, buildings. Uh, how buildings uh, and the practice of uh, um, arranging buildings, giving style to them, is a kind of an activism or is a certain kind of um, politics uh, of a different kind of scale. Uh, so let's look at three of them. Um, I, I thought I would compare uh, or let you compare a, a museum uh, with, with two housing projects. Uh, so let's look at the museum first. Uh, this is the Museum of Cleveland in, in um, the Museum of uh, Cleveland Museum of Contemporary Art, a non-collecting uh, museum where we were asked to design this building, which is not so big, it's 34,000 square feet, non-collecting. Uh, and they asked us for two, uh, two, the brief asked us for uh, a museum that is highly flexible uh, to cater for their changing exhibitions, uh, and also for the museum to be a living room, which we uh, tried to question what that would mean in the United States where museums are not free to enter. Uh, you have to pay to enter them the minute you get in. Um, we also try to question the, the, the question of flexibility. Contemporary art um, comes with a lot of um, diversity. Uh, it changes in scale from nano to giga. It uh, in weight from light to very heavy. In climatic requirements from uh, art that uh, doesn't need air, any air conditioning to those that do. Um, they also uh, use different surfaces of the gallery, so the idea that you only need walls that move um, about, uh, and that's the way, that's the only way that the museum is flexible, need to be questioned, because as you see uh, in this, uh, actually the floor, which is the group on the left, uh, is uh, the element of a gallery that most contemporary art uses as a surface of display. So, uh, the question of flexibility is a far greater and challenging um, issue than just the question of subdividing a space into different uh, amounts. Uh, the other challenge that comes with museums uh, is that uh, in order to raise uh, subsidy, subsidy, they have grown larger and larger, and uh, this growth uh, has been accumulating inside the museum a non-exhibition uh, program, which are of either education uh, nature or uh, also commercial in nature. We go to museums and see a lot of shops and restaurants that are raising subsidy for the museum. Now, these are added around the galleries and have contributed to this inflation of size of the museums. And the museums have become very much a kind of an institution, uh, no longer a flexible configuration for art. So we try to question this. How can the architecture of the museum change or shift these, um, these conditions that we find for contemporary art. So instead of uh, what I've just described, which is 
um, galleries that are confined uh, to just walls moving around, surrounded by these uh, ancillary programs that are also fixed? How can we think of all the spaces of the museum as spaces that uh, host both the exhibition program for art as well as the non the non art program, treating the non art program as also events with no permanent home of their own, but that they they can occupy any one of these spaces. The instruments that as an architect has to play with to somehow instigate uh, these are very ordinary, if you like. They are the fl floors and the wall, the envelope, the structure. Um, the uh, way you enter, the entrances. These are the instruments of architecture. And what I'd like to show is that each one of them are in fact agents uh, in, in delivering a certain kind of museum. Uh, one of the principal agents uh, of MOCA is the museum envelope. Uh, it is composed of smaller elements, or we could talk about them as smaller agents, uh, its shape, its entrances, its rain screen cladding, its fireproof paint, its structure, its windows, and here is how they perform. Now, the shape of the museum is, um, is a hexagon that grows into a rectangular roof. Um, the reason for this was that it was the best fit for its triangular corner site that you see there, uh, and it's also the best shape uh, to leave as much room as possible for a museum plaza onto which the museum events could spill out. The shape of the envelope is also um, the hexagonal shape, provides five different entrances to the museum so that it can be subdivided into distinct areas and be used separately. So uh, quite unconventional in that sense. The third agent is the fourth floor, uh, which uh, is where we located uh, at the very top, the paid gallery. Uh, and this allowed the rest of the museum to be uh, accessed without paying um, a fee, which means that the museum, just simply by making the decision of where you locate a gallery, becomes a much more flexible, uh, at the same time as an uh, uh, inclusive museum. The fourth agent of the museum are the, are, are the remaining floors, which are in between the ground floor, which is hexagonal, and the top floor gallery. Now, we uh, located the museum workshops and classrooms and the administration on these levels so that as people would walk up to the museum, they would uh, gain um, a kind of a, a certain experience, if you like, they would gain a view uh, of all these other kinds of activities that happen in a museum so that the museum would not be known as simply a place where you display art, but also as a place where you produce exhibitions. Uh, and the exhibition, um, if you like, making would be revealed to them as they would climb uh, through the different floors. The fifth agent is a double stair, double decker stair. Uh, we uh, stacked one of the egress stairs uh, one of the fire, scale, fire, fire stairs underneath the main stair to produce this very, if you like, monumental uh, looking stair. You see here the green is the, is, the, is the egress stair, the fire stair, and the public stair that would you, you would normally have is the red. Um, now, instead of uh, one way to climb the four floors, suddenly you have 10 different ways of climbing the four floors, so it brings choice to the visitors, whether they go through the closed route, whether they would go through the open route, whether they would mix a combination of them. So it makes the, the circulation non-linear. Now, the lower route is also then, uh, at, since it is an enclosed there, has been turned into a sound gallery. So it becomes a venue for art. So rather than thinking of uh, the art only being in the top floor gallery, suddenly we start spilling the art in all of the different museum spaces. Here it is sound. Uh, it is painted all yellow all over uh, so that we would um, somehow uh, steal away uh, the attention of the visitors away from the physical space, uh, make it uh, feel weightless, uh, dematerialize if you like, and focus their attention on the sound as they walk up the stair. Now, the upper route unveils itself uh, slowly because the museum is um, leaning, if you like, inwards because we are going from a hexagon to a rectangle at the top, which is smaller. Um, as it leans, um, it, um, it reveals itself slowly, this, uh, this, this route, which is cascading. 
We have made the landings wider so that we would encourage social interaction. So again, a small decision as, uh, such as making the landing uh, wider creates a possibility for people that they would otherwise not have. Um, it um, climbs up above also the main uh, fourth floor gallery so that it allows people to look inside the main gallery when exhibitions are being set up. Uh, so suddenly people are made to experience something that also they would normally not, uh, not experience. The building in front is a gallery. I arrived early, we wanted to get in, and they told us you cannot come in because we are setting up an exhibition where at MOCA you enter, the, gal the gallery is being set up for the next show, and you would walk up the stair and above the gallery and you would have that experience. Now, the Agent 8 uh, would be a, a, small, uh, a, a whole series of smaller scale elements uh, throughout the different floors that we call them switch elements that we provide them in order to, change, to, be, to allow each space to be used in more than one ways. Uh, these are all marked in, in the kind of the red um, uh, markings or annotations that you see, such as, for example, the fact that the stair gives two ways of access to each floor marked in yellow and, and blue, so that you can subdivide each floor in at least two ways. Um, there are glass walls between the admin and the public route, so that parts of the admin area, such as the boardroom, when not used, can be given over to the public program. We have a guillotine wall. Uh, the, the ground floor has many of them. For example, a guillotine wall that comes in, perhaps I can point it here on plan, and it subdivides uh, the, the lobby into a multi-purpose hall and the lobby or otherwise as one, and it goes on. We can see one of them is the museum store. This is how it works when the shop or the store is in full operation. The shelves and um, the, the mid-floor displays are designed on wheels so that they can be towed away uh, very easily and, and turned into an event space for art or for commercial uh, events that would, would rent the space of the museum. Or for example, the receiving door where the art comes into the museum is designed as part of the main uh, kind of cladding of the envelope concealed so that at times it would obviously receive the art that comes in um, and otherwise it could be used as a little outdoor amphitheater for performance art. Um, these are different scenarios that of the different floors, uh, no time to get into them in detail, that, but they reveal how uh, each floor is one thing and many things through the use of these switch elements. Um, the exterior cladding of the envelope is one of the micro agents of it. Uh, it is designed with a stainless steel, um, a mirror stainless steel in, in color black, um, strips that wrap around the building in a continuous uh, kind of a pattern um, so that they would not be orientated towards the, the ground uh, except perhaps a, a couple of uh, faces which are almost that. Uh, this uh, gives the building a sense of lightness because it's not referring to gravity. Um, the windows of the museum are also intentionally designed as part of this uh, banding that wraps around uh, the kind of the interior. Uh, they go over uh, and in front of the museum floors, disguising the presence of where they are to give the, the building not only a, a lack of sensation of load, but also a sense of scalelessness. Um, the museum is a much smaller building amongst neighboring buildings that are much taller, and by making it scaleless, in a way, it, it um, feels larger than what it is. Now, to introduce the dimension of time and a sense of transition, which, is, which would be in keeping with the art that also comes in and out all the time. It doesn't have a, a kind of a permanent collection. Uh, the cladding strips, uh, these bands of, of metal cladding, are uh, made to be very flat when they, when they uh, face each other, they come together, but they are uh, indented in the middle, what is referred to as an like oil canning uh, kind of effect so that whatever gets projected onto the reflective uh, cladding it becomes refracted, it becomes something new. Um, and because of the different orientations of the faces of this prism-like um, envelope, uh, it catches light 
uh, differently. And as you see here on the left, when the sky is gray, the building appears more gray and industrial. And on a more blue sky, one face is catching the sky and another face is catching the ground. And um, sometimes the different faces uh, are all kind of gaining different shades because of their different orientation. So it's a building that constantly appears differently. The joints between the claddings, as you see here, are minimal. And in fact, we've bent it around the corner uh, so that there is no seam at that point, so that images can, can, um, can carry across uh, the different joints. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, the oil can affect, creates these refractions that I mentioned. So uh, sometimes images get uh, stretched, um, and they are compressed, uh, they are refigured, sometimes they're delayed. Uh, or multipled, um, and they even project light onto the pavement uh, so that a, a kind of a transient landscape is produced as a dialogue between the metal cladding, the light, and the pavement. Um, so a, a different way of thinking about the relationship between the building and its context. Um, so as a result of clouds, leaves, uh, moving objects, the building is, is in constant transition and changes its image. Uh, windows are another micro-agent of the building. Uh, we often uh, see beautifully shaped windows in, in uh, some well-known museums. Um, they celebrate somehow the inside versus the outside and the frame the outside uh, through the inside. We try to explore uh, something else. Um, the window reveals are clad in mirror stainless steel uh, so that they display through reflection what is lateral, uh, into frontal view, uh, and this, of course, uh, constantly changes through the day. So the, the inside and the outside, when you are on the inside looking out, seem to dissolve into one thing, something that is neither one nor the, nor the other. Here on the left, you're seeing what's here on, on the lateral side, which is not in your view, uh, on, uh, and it becomes part of your view out. The mirror uh, reveals um, really bring in this idea that the reality outside is constantly changing. The sills of the, of the windows are also clad in mirror uh, stainless steel so that they engage light uh, and uh, as an activating agent in your experience of the galleries. Um, the view down never stops. Uh, sometimes uh, there, is a, there is a kind of an interesting relationship where the view, the, what you see from the cloud projected frontally seems to coincide with the pattern of the, of the paving and the landscape on the plaza. Uh, now, as a consequence of this, these decisions, which are to do with the building geometry, the, the, the cladding of the envelope, the treatment of the windows, etc., uh, the viewer's uh, perspective of the museum constantly changes depending on your point of view. So from certain points, it appears flat or skinny, from others, it can seem deep or fat. Uh, its prism-like shape engages you and forces you to walk around it, uh, walk around this freestanding museum in order to fully comprehend it. Closer up, it's the orientation of the two rhomboid faces um, that, um, as well as the apexes of its triangular uh, faces that catch your attention. There are four triangular faces that rise from the pavement to the sky and your eyes go upwards as you are close to the museum while there are triangular faces that descend to the ground from the parapet to the ground and here they bring your attention down to the street level and these are ways in which i think buildings do engage us uh, through their scale through their shape and geometry through their materiality now one of the faces is made in uh, glass entirely in glass and when the light is on inside especially on dark winter days uh, it brings your attention fully inside and reveals part of the museum to the exterior um, now um, um, cleveland has very severe weather in the winter and therefore, we do have to use revolving doors that you know they can be really awkward. You can see it in, in the faces of these people as they're entering the museum. Uh, now, museums and the, the process of entering the museum is a special moment. Uh, and uh, we try to work with this of what it means to enter and what is the difference between inside and the outside through the way we treat the two faces of the envelope, um, museum envelope. On the outside, we saw that 
It is a black mirror stainless steel. It's a rain screen cladding onto uh, its kind of um, envelope, which is a structural steel um, kind of metal um, uh, that acts in combination with the uh, steel framing. Now on the inside, to save budget, but uh, also to create this kind of surface tension between the outside and the inside, we decided to um, remove any kind of cladding to the, to the envelope and expose the structure. So on the inside, you see all this, uh, but then it needed fire resistant paint. Uh, so there was the choice of uh, what color paint. And we chose a, a color blue, a deep blue, uh, so that it would be in contrast uh, to, the, to the black exterior. Now, these are not um, two, uh, two experiences that are at odds with each other because, of course, as you move in, you understand that, uh, that the paint is onto a, onto a surface uh, which is holding up the rain screen cladding on the outside. Now, the blue paint uh, wraps all of the museum um, four floors and creates or provides a kind of continuity, curatorial continuity f across the different floors when there are exhibitions that are being uh, displayed or curated across all four floors. Uh, when it wraps around the fourth floor gallery, it subverts the idea of a white cube, which we have come to associate comp contemporary art museums uh, with, uh, where art somehow floats uh, and it's uh, detached from any uh, sense of uh, the reality outside. Now at MOCA, we have this blue uh, ceiling, which is dark enough to recede, uh, but then you realize that it's there. Um, it is dark enough to, uh, to create a, a kind of an orientation um, between, whereas perhaps here there is no sense of orientation or any relationship to uh, weight. Uh, here, the room is weighted uh, towards the lower area of the room uh, due to the contrast of brightness to the darkness where the art is. So the, the weight is on the art and that's where the attention of people is uh, focused on. Now we can see these are, these are, um, these are images of people on the first day uh, and going back to uh, Moka's brief to us, which was how to create the museum as a living room for Cleveland and how to make uh, a flexible destination for art. Perhaps we can go to the question of politics and how architecture has, can engage uh, politics of a different scale. Maybe we can call them micropolitics. Uh, I, could, I would like to argue that uh, we have created a museum uh, whose gallery is not just a conventional gallery. It is not just a white cube. It is not just a, a little outpost of MoMA in New York. It is unique enough to be Cleveland's own. And uh, also in response to uh, the requirement of the museum to be um, flexible, I think we managed to stretch the idea of flexibility beyond just uh, having a kind of a rectangle that is subdivided to think of the entire museum as a home for art and as a flexible destination. Um, and, and of course that is not just on the inside, but it's also outside. It's a museum that uh, changes also. It's, its expression changes constantly in response to its external environment and therefore uh, resonates with its changing exhibition and changing content. Uh, so let's now look at um, a housing project, which I think uh, we, we often think I showed the museum first because uh, it's easier to think that with housing, we think of politics uh, and, and activism. Uh, I think that in museums, there are different issues at stake and therefore the kind of activism and the kind of instruments that we have as architects to, to work with are different, um, but, but, but it's no less a place uh, in need of, of, of activism, a museum. Uh, I'm proud that MoCA is probably the only museum in America where you don't have to pay the, the minute you, you, you go in. And these things are, uh, are often taken for granted. Now, in the case of the housing project, um, we, uh, we, I, I'll show you two, hopefully I, I get to show the third one um, quickly. Um, this is in France, uh, the, the, in, in Paris, on the outskirts of Paris in Nanterre. A very special site uh, in uh, just uh, in Nanterre, past uh, the Arche de la Défense, uh, in the area of the axis of Paris, 
uh, as it extends to the River Seine. It's in between two cemeteries, so um, a very unusual situation because uh, it means that it's surrounded by a lot of nature and we tried to use this as an asset to the building. And now, the, the building, as you see here, is also the site was very long, so we knew that we, we were working with a slab kind of uh, typology. And with that comes uh, the, the, if you like, the, the burden that when you want to give people outdoor space, you're always um, uh, going to need these dividing walls between neighbors that somehow obstruct your view out. Uh, you only see kind of frontally, unless you kind of put your head out. Uh, with the slab typology also comes uh, often the idea of the corridor, uh, single aspect apartments, um, that are often dark and stuffy, so, so socially unsustainable because in fact, today in a large city like Paris, very different kinds of neighbors live next to each other and it's not to be assumed that they all want to live next to each other. It's most likely that they cannot buy a house of their own and therefore they are living in a, in a kind of a dense block. Uh, it's also, uh, you know, it, it, it takes people past uh, people's front doorstep uh, a situation that perhaps was sustainable at some point, but we now live again in, uh, even if we're all from the same background, uh, we don't all use our homes in the same way. Very often people use them to work from, so they have unpredictable comings and goings. We found out that, for example, in Paris, uh, a lot of people are airbnb all of their apartments, not just rooms, but all of their apartments. So if you live next to a neighbor that are airbnb all the time, it's not so comfortable. Uh, so uh, we are in urgent need of more privacy in our, in our, in our um, dense, uh, dense housing uh, forms. Um, we were blessed with a brief from the, the mayor of Nanterre, uh, which uh, asked for um, a diversity of uh, kind of user types to be in the same building. Uh, so we have students, we have social housing, we have a capped housing, so their prices are capped, and only the top four, uh, two floors could be sold at kind of market uh, prices. So it's a very unusual uh, uh, brief, which I believe should be like for any project that we do uh, now uh, in order to uh, embrace inclusivity in the city. Now, the way we could contribute to this as architects, given, given the fact that we didn't decide this good brief, was uh, how, how to express these, these uh, diverse inhabitants in the city. Now, our, our elements here are different, and so we looked for different kinds of groupings, uh, going back to the question of style, uh, so that we would mobilize them um, to uh, carry different kinds of agencies. The envelope is the agent um, that allows for uh, privacy. We occupied a shallower depth of the block. The red is our maximum area of buildable area. We, uh, we occupied a narrower uh, depth so that we could create double aspect apartments. So they could be subdivided uh, laterally as you see. Uh, doing away completely with the corridor uh, so that every two neighbors share a small landing um, and, uh, you know, elevator core and stair. Um, it, this allows uh, them to, uh, then we allow, structure is the next agent and we located the structure on all the black lines that you see around the cores and on the facade so that all the walls inside would be non-load bearing so that the residents would be empowered uh, to knock them down or add more whenever they wanted to. So again, small decisions that we can make that have uh, life-changing consequences for the people who live in them. Um, the shallow depths uh, of the envelope carries other kinds of agencies too. It creates, uh, as I mentioned, these double aspect units it also allowed us to uh, obviously provide the units with great natural ventilation uh, and also two outdoor spaces either side of each apartment. So at both ends, you have an outdoor room. Now, um, this meant that uh, we, uh, in order, we had two outdoor apartments and so the question was how to diversify the two different spaces. Uh, so we created a small shift on plan, two degrees, uh, and due to the length of the building, this uh, becomes quite significant uh, from one end to the other. It means that 
the, the open spaces are shallower at one end and deeper at other end. It diversifies them spatially. It also creates a step silhouette to the building, which means that every floor is shading the other floor, which means that we need only half the amount of shutters uh, to shield um, the apartments from the sun. Um, but it also means that uh, if you look at each of these, um, let me point them, that if this is a unit, or this is, this is a unit, that on one side, one unit has a recessed balcony, and on the other one, a protruding uh, open space, which we will look into. Now, uh, the other uh, small agent that we could work with are the fixtures. Now, in, I don't know what happens here, but in the UK, um, you know, apartments are fully fitted with more or less expensive kitchens that is not required, uh, that is not necessarily of everyone's taste. Uh, in this project, we intentionally uh, put the bare minimum fixtures so that we would allow, which of course is reflected in the cost of the apartments, uh, so that people would finish their apartments according to their own liking. Um, the envelope cladding is then the way that we have brought uh, inclusivity through the architecture of uh, this building to the brief we were given. All the elements, these are the different floors of the building. The top two floors are the maisonette, the middle one are the affordable, and the bottom one are the students. Uh, we took all the elements that are common uh, from the bottom to the top. So those are the dividing walls, uh, the balconies, the, the kind of the lodges, and designed them in exactly the same way. Um, just like a Hausmann uh, um, ex exterior envelope, Hausmann block, that has a unified facade, and today we can see uh, all kinds of uh, people are inhabiting uh, the units, smaller or larger, behind the unified facade. Here in our case, the, 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 the Hausmann facade, however, only provides a, a small Juliet balcony, so the open spaces are very small. In our case, uh, as uh, colored here with the, with the green and the blue, we have quite generous outdoor spaces either side of each apartment. So th this is the two sides of each apartment. You see on the left uh, a recessed uh, balcony and on the right a protruding loggia that has shutters. And uh, these are uh, varying as because of the tapering nature of the floor, giving the, 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 the residents uh, an incredible amount of choice. We were asked to provide only a two bedroom, three bedroom or four bedroom type of, of apartment. But through these spatial moves and these decisions, actually the choice that the residents have uh, in the building are far greater. Um, now, the envelope is made out of smaller elements. Um, uh, let's call them micro agents. There are the shutters, the handrails, the dividing walls, the soffit, the glazed walls, and these all make a difference in the way people occupy and use them. Uh, they're all made out of materials that require virtually no maintenance. Uh, because one of, the, one of the decisions that we make as architects that b quite often burden people with regular costs is you know, to up the upkeeping of buildings when they finish them. Now, this building is made out of glass, concrete, and aluminum, um, and hardwoods, very little maintenance, very little paint. Um, now, the lodges are assembled with handrails uh, and with uh, the shutters that I mentioned. Now, instead of these... The, the shutter supports, instead of these um, vertical uh, extrusions, we have designed them with these diamond shapes. Uh, what the diamond shape uh, extrusions uh, do is that they maximize the views in one direction and they minimize the views while minimizing the views in from other sides. Um, so you see here, you are seeing through uh, into the Grand Ash, whereas Frontally, when there are great tall office buildings in front, uh, they can be slid so that they, you, you gain privacy. Now, their orientations change. These are sliding shutters, and we've changed the orientation of these um, metal extrusions to correspond to the orientation of the sun, which will be different because the floors uh, are tapering. And now this means that the, the color of the building changes uh, from one end to the other and during the day. Uh, so the building, again, reacts to its environment. Um, they can, as I mentioned, slide to one side, so residents can enclose, it, uh, enclose their lodges entirely or obviously open them. Um, and um, when they're open, they become more similar to an open balcony. 
Now, the dividing walls between neighbors that you see here are made out of uh, glass, mirror-backed um, film, so that instead of being a barrier, uh, they reflect the outside context uh, onto them. Uh, they contextualize each resident's apartment or balcony in the place that they are living in, uh, and also they make them feel more expansive. Again, a material decision. Uh, here you see what is uh, behind reflected uh, forward, and, and the images that are reflected or brought in from the outside inside of each one of the, the, uh, these lodges are entirely unique to each resident, uh, because depending on where your lodge is in respect to the exterior, the kind of the view that you have of the outside inside of your balcony is totally unique to you. And I think that's another way where, where, um, where the apartments are, are multiplied in choice. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we, part of the structure is on the exterior wall. These are the black areas that you see here. They are partly structure and partly to, get, to, to achieve the necessary U values that you need to achieve for, for, a, for a housing project of this scale. Now, we were trying to make the building feel light and axial like the axe uh, in front of the building. Now, these are obviously vertical elements uh, that, that would be present. Now, in order to make them disappear, if you like, they are also clad with glass mirror-backed film, so they disappear uh, through reflection. So instead of a feeling of solidity, the exterior envelope becomes liquid, um, and uh, it feels light, or if you like, delicate, wherever you are, and a sense of interior-exterior continuity. Now, as for the balconies, which are the other sides of each neighbor's um, apartment, um, whereas the lodges allow them to be intimate because they have the, the shutters, uh, we want a little bit like the back garden of a house. We try to uh, explore or de develop the balconies a little bit like a front garden. So it's a bit more open. Uh, it has a view out to the outside. Um, so as you see here, the handrail is fully in glass. Uh, rather than with the metal supports. Uh, it has not even any metal structures to maximize its openness. Uh, the soffits are uh, painted uh, dark, as you see here, to frame the view outside um, and to conceal uh, many of the expansion joints that you need in the concrete slab. Now, they vary spatially. Uh, they are not as private. For example, the triple height balconies uh, there is some even overlooking from neighbors, but that's a choice that people have when they buy their apartment. Um, here is a view of one of the balconies, uh, and here is one of the triple height ones. This is the students' ones, uh, which, as you see here, is treated in exactly with exactly the same palette, except that every other dividing wall is made lower according to the wishes of the university so that the students could socialize with each other. Um, so, again, you see here that every of these balconies um, have a, are kind of unique because of the kind of reflections that are uh, in them and the kind of reflections of the context that comes in. Now, the handrail, uh, as I mentioned, is, is all glass. It's frit at the bottom um, uh, to give you a kind of a low-level privacy where your feet are, where furniture is, uh, and it disappears to, uh, to full transparency to allow light to enter, to, to, to hit the, or reach the plants uh, in case residents want to uh, garden on their balconies. Now, here is a view of one of the apartments. You're standing on, on the balcony of one, looking through, uh, through this double aspect apartment all the way to the other side. You see that they're highly urban uh, and they're highly open to the outside, and yet they are very private from their neighbors. And I think this is a, a little bit like what we experience in a house where we live in the city, but we have our privacy. Um, we can choose also how much of the outside to allow to enter into apartment. Now, the users, uh, if, if, if a building is uh, kind of a, a kind of a proposition uh, to neighbors is, of course, uh, we can only determine so much as architects. Uh, we can only see retrospectively how people react to, to buildings. And uh, it was interesting to see that before the building uh, even was handed in, you know, residents had bought the apartments off plan. 
um, and they were getting their keys and they had already set up their Facebook um, page as a way to communicate and exchange with each other. Uh, I'm sure you have, we, in, in England, we have uh, neighborhood apps which are uh, really a fantastic and I think encouraging um, phenomena where uh, people of uh, all kinds of walks of life and ages and uh, degree of affordability start exchanging with each other. If you're a student and you want to um, um, work part-time, uh, you could perhaps babysit for someone who uh, needs that. Or if you're an elderly and you want uh, somebody to fix your computer problems, you might uh, you know, connect with somebody else in your building that might have the computer skills that you don't have. So I think there is really a lot of, um, a lot of potential in looking again uh, um, uh, into uh, housing and how it can be more inclusive and how it can... Actually, uh, there is a lot more incentive now for people of different um, walks of life to live in one building together. Yeah. Uh, now, during the first week, we could already tell uh, that, uh, you know, people who had chosen to buy apartments in the building were quite different. Could this be a single man occupying the corner apartment? He chose his apartment next door to a sports arena that is often going to be very noisy. Uh, so obviously, that's not a concern to him. You know, he's a small family that uh, was, was very occupied, preoccupied with the move. But here is a young professional who, while she was moving, she was clearly using her apartment as a place to, as a live work. So she had to continue working while she was also unpacking. Here is a student who was busy studying. Here's a more traditional family where they had kind of started the move, but the first thing they completed was, um, you know, fitting out, uh, furnishing their apartment, the lodger, uh, balcony, sorry, so that they could have lunch together during the move. And here is um, one resident, uh, a narrow lodger, uh, where because of the shifting, uh, um, you know, uh, orientation of the floors, it doesn't have to bend out to look out. You see that she can easily have this oblique view of the axe. Um, lots of uh, neighbors using their um, balconies um, to garden. Uh, life pouring out of the building um, within its kind of simplicity and, and uh, confines. We could, we could see that life was pouring out. Uh, but the building was not just reacting to, to, the, to the users, as I mentioned, it uh, reacts also to its environment, to light and the color of the sky. It changes in color. Sometimes it appears quite dark and brittle. Um, if the sky is blue, it's, it's almost liquid blue. At other times, you know, when the sky is gray, it's also a gray building. Closer to it, it seems to float because it's not, the floors are not extrusions. Uh, or, you know, shearing on the corners that is, as if it is a building on the move. Um, it's flat uh, on the north side where it faces the cemetery because there was no, no need uh, to step the building to shade one floor um, by the other, so it is more flat. Uh, but on the other side, on the southern side, where there is the stepping of the building, uh, there seems to be a kind of a hint also by this uh, shift to encourage people to venture off the beaten track and explore all the different sides of the building, not just the grand axe, which is the kind of the public, um, uh, most public uh, side of the building, but also this, the, the, the cemeteries that are beautifully planted and are in quite contrast to the building. Uh, but then the semi-transparent nature of the envelope somehow seems to mediate between the inside uh, and the outside nature. Um, it is, of course, uh, an exam another example uh, of a different kind of politics, I would say. If there is a politics to this building, the same way that was uh, in Mocha, it's not a political statement. Um, it's uh, to do with arrangement. It's to do with selection and making choices in the building physical elements to give people the kind of choices that they would otherwise not have. And I think that that's the kind of politics that architecture can play. Uh, very quickly, um, uh, this is, I won't, a lot of it has, uh, are in common with, with the previous housing project in terms of giving residents choice and flexibility. Uh, this is also in France, but in the south of France where the weather is very warm. Uh, and the most uh, 
uh, unique uh, challenge here was how to allow people to use their apartments uh, and their outdoor spaces of their apartments uh, as if uh, they are living in total privacy in their back garden uh, as if they would have a house. So the elements are different and so their assemblage of course is different. The site is different. We have uh, a larger site. Uh, the envelope here is designed um, as a very compact form so that uh, it would have the most optimum environmental performance because it's more compact, but also to leave a huge garden around as a setting for the building. Um, the structure is again is placed on the core and on the facade so that all the apartments inside are free of any load-bearing uh, load elements. Um, they are divided into four corner apartments so that again they have cross natural ventilation. Um, but the, the, the biggest feature here is the shape of the floors, uh, which are curvilinear, um, uh, and the balcony is relative to the shape of the envelope in these curvilinear uh, floor shapes. Uh, our designs is designed so that one balcony has a 180 degree view out, but it never looks at the neighbor or vice versa. Um, so that the, the, the outdoor spaces of the apartments uh, are, 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 are like an outdoor room, if you like. Uh, like here that you see, it, is, uh, it, it only looks out. Uh, it doesn't look at any neighboring uh, apartment. And, and also, uh, because of the fact that it's so private, uh, uh, the intention was that it encourages a kind of an indoor-outdoor living, which is what you desire in a, in a warm climate. Now, in order to create more choice, uh, we have taken the single uh, uh, curvilinear floor plate, uh, rotated it and mirrored it on itself so that there are four typical floor plates. These are, re each one of them is used twice in alternating manners. Uh, so that uh, no two floors consecutive are identical, which means that from one floor to another, um, the balconies don't align. Uh, the red areas are the structure. There is nothing technically complicated here. They like to build in concrete in France, and the floor slabs are concrete, and the walls uh, are concrete. They just happen to be slightly curved. Um, the core uh, is in concrete. Um, and this shift, uh, and because of this uh, shifting of the floor place and uh, the uh, misalignment, if you like, of the balconies from one floor to another, we get two types of balcony, which are marked in light gray and dark gray, single height and double height. Uh, and uh, this um, um, silhouette to the building, which is uh, stepped, uh, and as you see here, we have you know, the single height balcony and the kind of the double height. Um, uh, and as a consequence, instead of this situation where when you look down, the, the balcony below is visible, in our case, it's two floors away. And so the downward looking, overlooking between one neighbor and another is reduced. Now, there is still a little bit of down looking through the, through the handrail, uh, which exists along all these red lines that you see on plan. So we, we use the, the handrail as an agent here to create extra privacy. So the handrail supports are densified. So they are brought closer to each other. Uh, as you see on the right, uh, in those areas where there is overlooking downwards so that they would give extra privacy. So the spacing between uh, the handrail supports is uneven um, uh, along any one balcony. Now, the envelope is one of the other agents to create a sense of lightness. You're in a warm climate, so you don't want the building to feel heavy. Um, the, the, the envelope is clad with corrugated uh, anodized aluminum, again, very low maintenance. Uh, it's not reflective because you wouldn't want a reflective skin in the, in the hot sun of Montpellier. Um, it absorbs uh, and is more um, sensitive, if you like, uh, than, than kind of uh, uh, the, the, the harsh reflections of Mocha, for example, or Nanterre. Now, three scales of corrugations are used, suggested by these three colors. Um, they are arranged relative to the slab edge that you see as a red line so that the larger they get, they stick out of the floor plate edge, as you see here, uh, to clearly mark that the cladding is a cladding onto the structure and it's not uh, load-bearing, so it has 
a sense of lightness. It's a light uh, cladding onto the load-bearing structure. Uh, and it becomes then also continuous with curtains that we uh, provide to the single height balconies. Um, now, as a result of the choices that we gave to residents here and the fact that in France, they, um, in this kind of um, market housing, they buy it off plan, they could come and uh, tell us exactly where they want their walls. And um, instead of four types, again, we have 36 different types of apartment, uh, their final configuration decided by the end user. So for example, this is the top floor. We can look at two apartments. Uh, one one uh, resident chose to put the kitchen uh, to one end and keep the room uh, all open, whereas the flanking um, uh, neighbor decided to put the kitchen right in the middle and divide the room into two. And these are, these are options that people have uh, due to simple decisions as to putting the structure in a, in a way which is not inside the apartments. Now, um, we don't know yet how people will use the balconies. We do know that the double height balconies are less private, but more sunny, as you see here, than the single height apartments. But the single height apartments are more shaded and also more private because they have the curtain. Uh, they can be closed to become an outdoor room. One of the uh, residents asked us to reinforce the floor because he has installed a jacuzzi on his, on his balcony because, of course, uh, nobody can see him. And if it's windy, uh, you know, he can just close, uh, close his uh, uh, single-height balcony so that he, the wind doesn't uh, bother him either. Uh, I would like just to finish with, with this slide uh, and go back to the question of um, buildings, activism, and, and agency. And uh, it's, 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 it's a diagram that I've tried to uh, summarize the relationship between the architect and uh, the end user. So on the left, uh, we see this kind of bubble, if you like, and inside of it are um, smaller bubbles. Uh, these are the different elements of, let's say, a building. And what the architect, uh, the architect's freedom is how to group these elements and how to interrelate them, uh, how to create the building as an assemblage of physical parts. Um, now, on the right, we see different end users, you know, person um, A, B, C, D, E. Um, now, these uh, are, each one of them are particular and therefore the different colors. They're particular because uh, they all come from different backgrounds, different interests, different age groups. Uh, so they don't all come uh, to experience a building with the same kind of frame of mind. Uh, now, they also are not all um, uh, have access to all parts of a building. You know, some people live inside of a, bu a residential building. Uh, some people live on the first floor and never see the top floor and the view of the building from the top floor. Some people don't live in the building and only walk around it. And uh, depending on people's disposition towards a building, they experience some or all aspects, I would call them affects of a building, and uh, through them coming into contact with some or all parts of a building, they go away for, with different kinds of affections. Affections can be sort of as uh, different moods, different thoughts, different feelings, different experiences. And, and so uh, we, we cannot determine meanings for people. We cannot determine their affections. Uh, but in an indirect way, we, we, we put buildings in front of them as propositions, uh, as as offerings, if you like. And, and I think that it's important to keep this in mind because we have so often in architecture uh, uh, tried to resort to the construction of meanings as a way to uh, reach society. And I think that uh, actually we have a more indirect, but we are still connected to, to how society evolves. Thank you.